Welcome to Gun Freedom Radio. I am your host, Cheryl Todd, and I am very excited to be sitting down today for a fairly in-depth discussion with someone who honestly needs very little, if any, introduction. But our guest today is Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman. Now, David Grossman is a U.S. Army. Uh, he's retired. Thank you for your service, sir. He is the director of Killology Research Group, an author, a speaker, former West Point psychology professor, and all of this geared toward this one goal. We must protect the children who have been entrusted to our care. Welcome to Gun Freedom Radio. Well done, Cheryl, and nice beginning. You're the Lone Ranger today, firing silver bullets of truth and justice in the, in the media world today. I'm so glad to have you on board, and I'm so proud to be a part of what you're doing. I honor you, and I honor your listeners who are just doing a, a, who, who are seeking deeper knowledge and greater information. I'm so proud to be on board with you. And of course, what's occurring right now in the news are uh, two major massacres, a whacked out uh, right winger, if you will, in El Paso, a whacked out left winger in Ohio, uh, committing mass murders. And, and, and what is the common denominator? And just real quick, I wanna just get your audiences in here. You know what, front page article, USA Today, last October, uh, study confirms link between violent video games and physical aggression. Mm. Every major medical, psychiatric, psychological group has made definitive statements. The new factor it, it is something fundamentally new is happening. And you ask yourself, what is the new factor? And the, the, the sick TV shows, the sick movies, and especially the sick video games are the new factor. And it is worldwide. The big lie out there is, well, it's not happening in another nation. Yes, it is. It's just being censored. You know, here we've got nine kids murdered in a school in China, a middle school in China. Nine kids murdered with a knife. Well, well why wasn't that headline news? Well, because it's only happened in America. And, and, and it's only happened because of guns. Here's, a, here's last October. So last October, we had a, a mass murder in a college in Russia. 20 dead, 20 dead mm. in a college in Russia. We've got, we got uh, a more than 50 wounded. Russia had their own Virginia Tech, and it didn't even hit the news. Google uh, Russia College Master, Crimea, it'll come up. Didn't even hit the news. So what's happening is this is worldwide. These juvenile mass murders are happening around the planet. Here is, uh, go to Wikipedia, any of your listeners, go to Wikipedia, look up the most homicidal nations in the world. I, I printed out the first 22. Uh, the, uh, and uh, of the 22 most homicidal nations in the world, the only ones that have any gun rights is Brazil and South Africa with limited gun rights. Anywhere you look at nations with unarmed citizens, you see empowered criminals. I mean, look on that list of 22 most violent nations in the world and tell me how, gun, how the, the gun laws work out for them. Here's Mexico, a, a nation that's been denied any right to protect themselves who, who are condemning us. Now, how are those gun laws working out for Mexico? You know, so the, the point becomes that this is a worldwide phenomenon and information that would say so is just being filtered out. And the media has its blood on their hands and they will systematically filter any information that points a finger back at them. They have this blood on their hands. Of course, the key, the key dynamic is my book, Assassination Generation. I gave a copy to the president after the Parkland massacre. I was in the White House, the President Brown table on violent video games. The video game industry told the president, sir, we have a rating system. We enforce the rating system. I said, Mr. President, these guys are lying to you. It's all in my book. So I slid a copy across the table to the president. I, I said, these guys refuse to enforce their rating systems. Uh, one of the most popular games on the planet, 200 million people playing a game called Fortnite. Uh, it's hyper addictive. Now, 200 million people play the game. We do this and 0.5% say, well, that's a good time to quit the game. So they never do that again. We do this and absolutely nobody quits the game. So they do more of that. It's an interactive feedback loop to make these games impossible to turn off. Adults play in the games until they die. Adults mess themselves and wet themselves while they're sitting because they can't leave the game. These are digital crack. 15% of all divorces in America, video games are the cause. 
and 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 fifteen percent. You know, the spouse says, "What's more important, the game or me?" Now, that's easy. The game. We're divorced, and, and and so these these games are destroying adults. Children are being eaten alive by these games, and the industry fought all the way to the Supreme Court. It's all in my book, Assassination Generation. The video game industry fought all the way to the Supreme Court. They fought dirty. They have vast amounts of money uh, to, to sell any game to any child at any age. So recognize this is worldwide. There's one new factor, and the information that is not coming out is about the sick video games, the sick TV shows and movies, and it is not going away until we stop feeding the sick stuff to our children. And I tell my, anytime I'm online, I tell people that guns didn't change. You know, here's an M1 carbine. Hundreds of thousands of flooded America after World War II. It'll do the same thing an AR-15 does. 30-round magazine, semi-automatic military weapon, M1 carbine. After World War II, hundreds of thousands flooded America. It, the guns didn't change. Mm -hmm. You know, double stack, high capacity, nine millimeter pistol. What about a Browning high power? Came out in 1935. Thousands and thousands flooded America after World War II. Again, the guns didn't change. We changed. Our children changed. I co-authored a book with Glenn Beck called Control. I, I wrote a good third of the book. Uh, uh, a New York Times bestseller, uh, Control, not one single review. You can attack a bestseller. What you cannot do is completely refuse to even mention it. This mm -hmm. is the leadership that we're facing. These crimes are happening worldwide. And, and the guns didn't change. We changed. The nation of the most rigid gun laws see the most horrendous massacres. And yet the industry that has blood on their hands, they've got to point the finger somewhere else. And so they say it's all about the guns when the truth is that armed citizens is the only thing that's stopping us from being Mexico. Well, you touched on several really important points, and I think you've helped me understand the video game angle better than I, I had previously. Because it, being you know in this Second Amendment world and, and owning a, a firearm store, AZ Firearms, often I just hear the blame, right? So people just want to blame something. So it's either the gun or it's uh, this umbrella thing called mental health. That's the new catch word, right? The new catch phrase. Um, or they want to blame video games. And I know lots of people who uh, love video games, play a lot of video games, and they're, you know, they are not uh, marching around, you know, mowing people down with um, whatever, whether it's uh, bombs made out of pressure cookers or whether it's, um, you know, a, a van they rented and they're barreling down a, a sidewalk killing people or whether they picked up a firearm. Um, but you're talking about something very different. It's, it's the addiction to a video game. Um, and when you talked about how the video game, they, they adjust it, it sounded like you said almost in real time, the, the people that develop the video game, so that it stays as interactive and addictive as possible. And I'm thinking, well, that's almost like, Facebook, like there's a ding, there's a, a click, there's a something that just keeps pulling you back into uh, your focus being on that that little handheld something or sitting in front of a, a, a television in that way with your video game. And uh, I mean, adults, yeah. if adults can be lured and drawn into this addiction, then I can only imagine uh, the young minds of um, our children and our teenagers. Amen, amen. And most video gamers, most adult video gamers will agree that children shouldn't have access to these violent games. And, and so nobody should be telling adults what they can or cannot do. Nobody should be talking book banning or, or free speech. But violent visual imagery marketed to children has an immediate impact on their brains. We got brain scan data from around the planet. Violent visual imagery inflicted upon children. Their body treats it like it's real. They go into a fight or flight mode. And, and so that's the new focal point. But here's another dynamic. These, you mentioned Facebook. Uh, we talk about, about cell phones and the video games. That they all create sleep deprivation. Mm. We're in the middle of a civilization-wide epidemic of sleep deprivation. Mm. 
uh, sleep deprivation creates uh, impaired judgment. And to, to sleep deprivation is a key predictor of suicide. To take your life is not a natural act. Every living creature has a powerful drive to self-preservation. But you've, you've got to have profoundly impaired judgment to take your life. So alcohol, uh, very, very deep, profound depression. But one of the most pervasive forms of impaired judgment is sleep deprivation. Mm -hmm. After 18 hours without sleep, your kid has impaired judgment equal to 0.08 legally drunk. Mm -hmm. After 24 hours without sleep, your impaired judgment equal to 0.10 above legally drunk for impaired judgment. And, and after two nights without sleep, you are psychotic. Mm -hmm. Any graduate of Army Ranger School like me will tell you about hallucinations on the third day without sleep. And so and understand how addictive these things are. We've got the predisposition of violence added to this sleep deprivation. The two major killers of our kids are suicide and traffic deaths. And both sleep deprivation is a key component. The third major killer is drug overdoses. Just taking drugs is impaired judgment. But another angle on this whole dynamic is, is sleep deprivation creates chronic pain. And so the opiate epidemic, Prescription opiates have always been there. What is, you've got to constantly say, what is the new factor? The guns have been there for a century and, and, a, and a half. What is the new factor? Hmm. The opiates have been there. Well, but sleep deprivation creates chronic pain. Doc, I heard all the time, give me a pill to fix it. You don't need a pill. You need more sleep. Turn off the video game. Turn off the Facebook. It, turn your cell phone off and get some real sleep. And so sleep deprivation creates chronic pain. We've got this interactive dynamic of these, these addicted video games creating sleep deprivation, reinforcing violent models on children. We've yeah. got the brain scan data coming in from around the planet. So one website I, I would recommend all your leaders is screenstrong.com. Screenstrong, one word, dot com. It takes this media addiction in children from a medical perspective. And again, we're looking at sleep deprivation. We're looking at media addiction of children. Nobody should be telling adults what they can or cannot do. But children who grew up with this stuff are strongly predisposed. And, you know, when I was a kid, I never buckled my seatbelt. Every kid I know, nobody buckled their belt. We're all just fine. Not every kid with this belt unbuckled died. Most ones that died had their seatbelt unbuckled. Not all the kids that played these games become killers, but all the killers played these games. I commend your attention to a book called Inside the Mind of a Teen Killer by Phil Chalmers. Phil Chalmers has interviewed hundreds of these kids. The teen killers are almost non-existent in history, and now they're everywhere. And Phil has a chapter, How to Create a Teen Killer in 10 Easy Steps. Mm. And all the old problems are still there. All the old problems are still important. But every single time, there's one new factor. They're obsessed with the sickest movies and TV shows and video games. Phil, Phil teaches cops. I teach cops. We tell them, look, don't ask the little killer where you're inspired by a movie that makes them mad. You ask any little killer, just strike up a conversation. So we're like, hey, man, what, what's your favorite movie? I watched Natural Born Killers over 50 times. The Columbine Killers watched the movie Natural Born Killers over 50 times. Prior to that point in history, it was not possible to watch a movie. If it wasn't on TV at the theater, we didn't watch it. Mm -hmm. So, hey, man, like, so what's your favorite TV show? I watch Breaking Bad and Sons of Anarchy and Sopranos over and over again. What's your favorite video game? I played Grand Theft Auto V until 4 o'clock in the morning, month after month. Phil says you take any little killer, you sit him down and ask him three questions. Just don't, don't ask him was he inspired by a movie. That makes him mad. Get inside their head. Favorite TV show, favorite movie, favorite video game. Boom. Every single time. This is the new factor. And so we strive to protect our children from this violent media. But a critical component, the situation is much worse than it looks. Mm -hmm. Medical technology is holding down the murder rate. So if we had World War II level medical technology in Afghanistan, we'd have 10 times many dead American troops. And the same thing is true in America. If we had Vietnam level medical technology in Iraq, we'd have 10 times, five times many dead American troops. The same thing is true in America. And in all these other nations, mm -hmm. the murder rate has been held down by medical technology. I asked my cops, how many all carry a tourniquet? Every hand goes up. 
How many carried tourniquets 10 years ago? Nobody. Tourniquets alone may have cut the murder rate in half in just the last decade. Mm -hmm. A cop slaps on a tourniquet, he saved a life, he's prevented a murder. Mm -hmm. The ER room saves a life, they prevented a murder. Mm -hmm. We gotta understand that one of the critical components, I'm like, you smack your head and say, of course, medical technology is holding down the murder rate, why isn't that being reported in the media? Mm -hmm. I tell you, these guys have blood on their hands and and they've got to downplay the problem. Here's one of the most amazing things. I trained the American Sheriff's Association earlier last month. And we're looking at the number of people murdered in America. And in 2015, 2016, the number of people murdered exploded like nothing we have seen in modern history. And I asked my sheriff, why wasn't that in the news? If that was a stock market, we'd hear about it every day. Go to the UCR, Uniform Crime Report. Look at the number of people murdered. Plot your own graph and ask yourself why that wasn't in the news. And, and so the, these worldwide massacres are happening. This explosion of violence in America is happening. Uh, Latin America is out of control. Medical technology is holding down the body counts. What's that mean to us? What are the action points? Number one, protect your children. Go to ScreenStrong.com. Read my book, Assassination Generation. Read Glenn Beck's book, Control. Number one, protect your children. Number two, uh, give your children good stuff. Take them outside. We have a nature deficit disorder. We need to take them hiking, take them hunting, take them outside. Now, for the first two days, they're detoxing. They're miserable. The fight or flight hormones are flushing out of their brain. When you detox that kid for the first two days, it's miserable. And then it's like somebody flipped a switch. So protect your children, but also protect yourself and protect your family. Mm. The media says there is no boogeyman, there is no bad man. They're wrong. The murder rate has exploded. It is worldwide. And the number of dead people underrepresent the problem. It's actually much worse than it looks. How many of us wish we'd have been at that Walmart in El Paso when that massacre happened? Mm. How many of us said gun owning citizens said, I wish I'd have been there. I'd have have laid my life down Mm. to have been there and have stopped that individual. Mm. The answer is not taking away guns. Mm -hmm. The answer is trained, armed American citizens. Israel has faced this threat for three quarters of a century. Israel has found the only answer. You do not win by taking away rights. You win by giving them more rights. Give them the right to protect their children, the right to fight back. And and yes, as much as the media hates it, the answer is Israel's answer, armed American citizens shooting back. In the Ohio massacre, Cops were there in seconds and gunned that guy down. That happened to be cops shooting back. It could have been armed citizens. When an armed citizen does stop a massacre, you never hear about it. It's the one where nobody was there to shoot back that you hear about. So recognize the fact there is an answer you can do right now. Number one, protect your children. Mm-hmm. Violent visual imagery inflicted upon children is child abuse. Their body treats it like it's real. Number two, protect your family, protect yourself, protect your nation. Mm-hmm. armed, trained citizens. It's not enough to have the gun. You got to also be good with it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm a big fan of hojutsu, the martial art of the firearm, H-O-J-U-T-S-U.com, hojutsu. I trained for years to get my black belt in hojutsu. Uh, uh, and, uh, and if you want to strive, you know, 20 million Americans are in the martial arts. Only a couple thousand compete. The idea of striving for the next belt, of striving for the next standard, to take the martial arts and apply it to firearms is brilliant. Hujutsu.com. And, and protect your children, protect your family, protect your nation mm-hmm. by being armed, trained citizens, and take this violent visual imagery out of your children's lives. If you'd have told my mom to buckle up those five kids, she said it wasn't possible. It became the law and it got done. Don't wait for it to be the law. Protect mm-hmm. your children now. Take this violent visual imagery out of their lives and protect them. As, as at the same time that we arm ourselves, protect our family, also protect them from the sickness that comes over that screen. Uh, let them watch the virtuous good old shows, Bonanza and Gunsmoke and, and, and all those good old virtuous shows where, where violence was used when it was necessary to protect lives and it was not vividly depicted. Mm. Fill your children's lives full of good things and take the bad things out and protect them from the sick media and the sick video games 
and the violent world out there that is coming to harm our citizens. Arm yourself, train yourself, and the old values that were carved into the DNA of our nation with the Second Amendment is the right of the American citizen to protect themselves. You know violence, you know what to do about it, but this violence being fed to our children and TV, movie, and video games, you need to know what to do about that. ScreenStrong.com, my book, Assassination Generation, is a good place to begin. Absolutely. I, I can't agree with you more uh, about the, the very proactive stance that, you know, even if we're not parents, we, uh, maybe we have nephews and nieces. Maybe we have a, a sphere of influence um, because we volunteer at church or something like that. We can help people to better understand the benefits. We don't have to, you know, parent shame you know, and say, you're doing this wrong, but we can definitely, you know, point them in a different direction and say, hey, there's this wonderful group that goes out and, and does, you know, outdoor yoga, or there's this wonderful group that's going up into the, the pines over the weekend and, and find ways to possibly get them where they, you know, and initially that's going to be foreign to them because they want their air conditioning, they want their sofa, they want their... The fight, for, that? The, the, for the first two days, they're detoxing. They're miserable. The fight or flight hormones are flushing out of their brain for the first time in Lord knows how long. So ride out those first two days. Be careful. This is a, a dangerous time. But after two days, like somebody threw a switch and detox those kids. Amen. I love it. Um, and when you were talking about uh, the, the, a lot of these uh, killers, uh, when you ask them what their favorite show or their favorite movie or whatever is, and you know, they, they would name off some very violent things. Uh, I have two things to, to say about that. One is a question and one's a statement. The statement is there's this new movie out that uh, I have zero intention of seeing because it looked all fun and cute and everything. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm totally going to see that. It's called once upon a time in Hollywood. And then I saw, the part of the preview where a lady steps out and goes, hi, I'm Sharon Tate. And I'm like, hold the phone a minute here. Are they going to try to make the Manson murders where Sharon Tate was murdered in her home and she was pregnant when she was murdered and her baby was cut out of her body? Are they going to try to make that cute and you know, funny? What they did, Cheryl, what they did in the movie was they rewrote history with two Hollywood guys who killed the attackers on Sharon Tate. So, you know, we're, we're still giving notoriety to these horrible killers, but we're showing now vivid depictions of violence, flamethrower death, when people are French fried alive, flamethrower death of these people who came to kill Sharon Tate. It's a Sam Peckinpah movie. Peckinpah has always been extraordinarily violent. Uh, and, and you're right, you know, just, just protect your children from these images. I recognize that the, the, these, are, these people in Hollywood are not our friends. Uh, they're trying to take your guns and feed death to your children. Uh, and, and their only answer to the impact of the sickness is, well, take guns away when that is not really the answer. Once the guns are gone, we'll be like Mexico, we'll be like any of the 20 top, we'll be unarmed and still be victims of violence. The criminal will always change the law. The it's criminal will always break the law. It is the weirdest kind of logic to me. The, the media, the news, uh, the politicians, they're doing everything they can to terrify the, the American public, terrify us that at any moment these things can happen, which is true. At any moment, these things can happen. There are predators out there. There are murderers walking amongst us. They're doing everything they can to terrify us, and they say, but your solution is to completely disarm yourself and i'm like i'm sorry what where did yeah. the logic train yeah. go amen hey you know full disclosure uh i i co-own a gun company with my son as you guys do uh we're sheepdogknifeandgun.com we got access to all of the daytonics 45 1911 legacy parts we're making the last batch of 1911s every uh, daytonics every one of them is custom made I test shoot, and I've got five groups, a, a, a target that I test shot five groups with every one of these guns. My son's a master gunsmith. 
a, a, a four or $5,000 gun available for less than two grand, 1995, uh, the, the last legacy Daytonics guns, real, 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 uh, uh, truly going to be collector's items, uh, sheepdogknifeandgun.com, sheepdogknifeandgun.com, uh, arm yourself and arm yourself well and get a, a five, four or $5,000 gun for under two grand, uh, uh, the last of the customs, the tonics guns, uh, sheepdogknifeandgun.com. I love that. And I want you to help uh, the part of my audience that's unfamiliar with the, the terminology sheepdog, help them better understand what do we mean by sheepdog to have the sheepdog spirit, um, you know, sheepdog mentality and mindset. You know, it's, it's funny you mentioned sheepdogs. Uh, Joe, grab a copy of, uh, of the two kids books, please. You, you mentioned sheepdogs. Uh, the whole sheep, the wolf, and the sheepdog thing has gone viral, but it's an extract of my book uh, on combat. On and we've lost you for a moment. I'm going to pause for a second and come back when you do. All right, so the whole sheepdog thing was an extract out of my book on combat. On combat, Marine Corps Commandant's required reading, issued in the DEA Academy, issued at the Marshals Academy. And uh, uh, we, we took the material on the sheep, the wolf, and the sheepdog, which has become viral, turned it into a kid's book. It's a sheepdog kid's book. And it's really had an impact. It's just touched so many lives about we don't want to raise wolves, we don't want to raise sheep, we want to raise a generation of sheepdogs who are protecting. And it, it's primarily about military and law enforcement sheepdogs. It's got the original sheepdog essay in the back, which is the older kids from five to 95. People are rocked by this book and the essay is back. And people have trouble reading it without choking up. But, you know, I speak at the NRA every year. I speak to civilian groups. They said, Dave, what about a civilian sheepdogs? And so we, we wrote the book, Why Mommy Carries a Gun. If anybody in the family, mom or dad, grandma, grandpa, going to carry a gun, here's what we want the kids to know. Find a gun, stop, don't touch, get an adult, for universal gun safety laws, Second Amendment, our heritage. And in particular, it's got great illustrations. And in particular, it's got uh, a it's got uh, famous sheepdogs throughout our history. It, it's so much fun. The fam everybody has a page. The Minutemen, Davy Crockett, Harriet Tubman, always carried a gun. Lifelong Republican, always had a gun. Wyatt Earp, Annie Oakley, uh, Sergeant York, Alvin York. He's a Yorkie in the book. A fierce little Yorkie with a 1911 in its hand. There's hidden verses in Revelation 1911 is on the side of his pistol. Audie Murphy, Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt carried a gun for her entire lifetime. Uh, uh, she had a pistol permit, and she drove herself around in the 1950s uh, uh, speaking and presenting on civil liberties, and one of which was the right to keep mere arms, which she cherished and exercised for her whole lifetime. So great stuff in the book, uh, Why Mommy Carries a Gun, the Sheepdog Kids books, and, uh, and it'll explain it there and help you understand what it's all about, what we do. We are the sheepdog. We are the protectors. We have been placed on this earth to protect the flock and to uh, and to protect our, our fellow citizens and uh, taking away the guns is not going to empower the sheepdogs it is going to empower the wolves mm. boy that's, that's, and trained and ready. that's so well said so um just uh, talk about your website and and the bulk of the work that you do over there um the website's called killology Dot com. Now, there might be people that clutch their pearls and go, oh, my stars, what the, what the heck is killology, right? And so, you know, it, well, we have geology, uh, right. we study rocks and so forth. Right. We have biology, where we study, you know, not just the human body, but, you know, all, all uh, living creatures. Psychology is the study not of the brain, but of the mind, right? And so tell us a little bit about what it, killology is. Killology is a scholarly study of killing. Uh, I talk about sexology or suicidology. And, uh, and not homicide, but lawful killing. How do we get uh, a, 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 somebody to pull the trigger in a life and death event? My first book was on killing. It's translated to eight languages, half a million copies sold worldwide. 
Uh, as Google Scholar says it's cited in over 2,500 scholarly works, one of the one of major scholarly impact on our civilization. And, and in a nutshell, uh, we study how we train people to kill. And in World War II, we found out most of the troops wouldn't pull the trigger. It was a training flaw. We taught them to shoot bullseyes. Mm. We had no known case any bullseyes ever attack on our troops. If you've been in the U.S. Armed Forces since the Korean War, you never shot a bullseye. A man-shaped silhouette pops in field of view, hit the target, target drop, stimulus response, stimulus response. Like a pilot in a flight simulator, like a kid in a fire drill, modern military training turns killing into a conditioned response. Mm. And we got, we got the vast majority of the troops from not pulling the trigger at the moment or two to pulling the trigger almost without conscious thought, stimulus response. And oh, by the way, the video games are doing the exact same thing to our children. I begin the book with this. I tell people, look, people point some horrible crime. Ah, oh, bros, are all killers. No, that, that's an outlier. That's literally one in a million. You explain to me the 99.9% .9 of our citizens will go a lifetime, never kill anybody or see, even seriously try to. Explain that. Divorce, infidelity, layoff, traffic accidents, and less than one in a thousand citizens in a lifetime will even seriously attempt to take a human life. Explain that. Inside most healthy members of our species is a pretty hardwired resistance against killing their own kind. Sociopaths don't have that resistance. Healthy people have to be trained to kill. And oh, by the way, the video games are doing the exact same thing to our children. Mm. And not every kid with a gun is going to kill. Not every kid empowered is going to kill, but we all agree on keeping guns out of the hands of our children. And we should agree on taking these, these violent video games, these empowerment training tools away from our children. We want disciplined, structured use of violence. The old shows, the old movies, the virtuous, honorable message that we used to communicate mm -hmm. is still a virtuous, honorable message to give to our children, not the sick, twisted message in video games and modern movies and, and TV shows. So we talked earlier about the importance of getting kids um, away from the screens and out in nature. And one of those ways uh, to reconnect kids with nature and, and how we as a species go about you know, harvesting food and feeding yeah. ourselves and that sort of thing, that can also be incorporated into firearms training, safe firearms training, family time, uh, firearms training for children, it teaches them discipline and focus and follow through and all the things that we, we really would like them to know, but we have to do it in a, a proper and structured way. And then if we're out hunting with them in nature, all these other benefits are there, then they see the actual real results of when a projectile leaves the end of a firearm in yeah. real life, not in digital world where you, you kill the bad guy and he stands right back up in the next scene, right? None of these killers have been hunters. None of them. Not a single one. Mm -hmm. None of them were in the martial arts. One kid, the kid in Springfield, Oregon, dabbled for a few weeks and dropped out. The video, oh, he had a blue belt. It was the lowest ranking belt. He dabbled and dropped out. The only one that even tried. Mm -hmm. None of these kids were in contact sports. None of these kids were involved in anything. They didn't have a life. Mm -hmm. And most especially, none of them were competitive shooters and none of them were hunters. Uh, get your child out to the range with structured discipline on a range type, you know, and on the range, you point the gun in the wrong direction, you fire in the wrong time, enormous sanctions come down on you. Mm -hmm. uh, take your child hunting mm -hmm. and, and let them be exposed to the cycle of life at a young age. Death, we live because things die. Yes. You know, uh, uh, even for your plants to be possible, we, uh, we exterminate millions of rats and mice around the greenery. You're a vegetarian, I'm sorry, but the only thing that keeps our vegetarian alive is exterminating millions of rats and mice around our greeneries and our feed store. Otherwise, they'd get in there and, er and reproduce exponentially and we would starve to death. The only way we live is by killing. It's a cycle of life and hunting is a critical piece of the equation. None of, this, none of these killers, none of them have even remotely done any hunting. None of them have been competitive shooters. That structured, disciplined dynamic is what's missing in their lives. Absolutely. Do, can you speak at all to um, the effect that it has on the public in general? When we are seeing um, the, the newscasts 
where this one event or, you know, these several events over the last couple of weeks, um, the, the murderer in Gilroy, and then the murderer in El Paso, and then the murderer in, um, in uh, Michigan, no, oh, wow. Ohio, pardon me. Um, when we're absorbing that, that trauma, right? We're, we're seeing other people who've been, you know, their lives have been wrecked by this. Do we then absorb some of that trauma and carry that forward with us? To a certain degree. I, I think what's an even greater danger is when they turn these killers into celebrities. Every time they say their name, every time they show their picture, they're inciting us that others to do the same. Mm-hmm. And you know that, that, that massacre in New Zealand, they said, we'll never say his name, we'll never show his picture. Finally, somebody gets it. Mm-hmm. Well, our media, look at this latest batch of killers. Mm-hmm. Our media has learned their lesson, I pray. You see them, they're not saying the names, they're not showing their pictures, but they won't talk about the fact that they are self-censoring. They, they won't turn the camera back on themselves. Mm-hmm. The things they will not talk about. Uh, in, back uh, 30 years ago, they came to an agreement to not talk about teen suicides because if they report teen suicides in the news, they get more teen suicides. So here they are, they've self-centered, good for them, but they will not talk about it. Mm-hmm. They completely offline to the secret cabal, said, okay, we can't talk about this anymore. We all agree to that. And they never turn the camera on themselves. Mm-hmm. Now they stop turning these killers into celebrities. They have blood on their hands from what they've been doing but they will not turn the camera back on themselves. They've made this internal agreement with overwhelming, irrefutable scientific evidence. Every time they show their name and, and, and uh, show their picture and tell their name, they're inciting others to seek the same kind of thing. Finally, they've agreed it would appear, and yet they refuse to even talk about it. The, 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 the insidious evil of the media, who, who even when they do do the right thing, will not turn the camera back on themselves. So yes, to a certain degree, we're all traumatized by these things. But think about somebody who grew up in World War II. Think about somebody who grew up in, like me, in Vietnam. Uh, We had live reporting of incidents. Uh, We saw people in combat. We, uh, so this reporting, uh, adults can handle that stuff. Think very carefully about to what degree your children need to see it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And to what degree we need to protect our children from, from so much of the bad stuff that's happening in this world especially very young children, definitely need to be protected from the news. If you've got the news on all the time and your children are absorbing that, especially if very young children, you got to ask yourself, what am I putting in their head? What am I feeding to them? Yes. I had to learn that lesson um, because of 9-11. My daughter was, um, I think she was nine. I, I have to go back and remember exactly how old she was, but she could not handle anything that sounded like a news alert. She would just freeze up. And we lived in Arizona. We were so uh, geographically far removed from New York where it happened. But uh, the, the, the fear was it could happen again at any minute. And is this the start of something that's just going to keep going and going? And uh, so I had to stop listening to talk radio for quite a while while she was in the room with me, you know, in the house with me and the news. And um, so that's kind of where my my question came from is that, you know, are we uh, traumatizing ourselves? We we need to know what's going on in the world. We need to be informed. But when they go wall to wall with the news cycle for, you know, a 24 hour period or however long they talk about, you know, the El Paso uh, incidents and, and then followed by the ones in Ohio, I I just, I think that not only is it, possibly traumatizing for us and our children who are in the room, but also maybe it stirs up that next killer to think, well, even if they're not saying his name, look at this publicity, look at what's going on in the world. They have captured wall to wall. Every single word for the next 24 hours is going to be about this guy. I want that. This is called the contagion effect. And we know that. Uh, We know that there's that happening. Again, we can reduce it by refusing to turn the killers into celebrities, but this contagion, violence contagious dynamic uh, is very real. It's there, uh, and the media is taking these particular, you know, we don't report what's happening in Chicago every day, 
but we we over report these tragic events and and for political purposes uh, they have a political agenda and trying to to blame all this you know it said that you got the one killer in ohio is a left-wing nutcase and the one in in uh and they don't talk about him. They want to pin the whole thing on the current administration mm-hmm. when the truth is that it's, it's happening across this political spectrum of violence empowerment. The guy that shot up the, the Republicans in the baseball, you know, in the, in, the, in the congressional baseball, they don't talk about that one. So just recognize the fact that uh, it, it is a factor. We do see the contagion. The over-reporting of this violence is a factor. Protecting your children is essential mm-hmm. to you do as an adult from these images. I, I'm a huge fan of getting my news from the written word. I like foxnews.com. I like breitbart.com. I got others that I listen to. I'm a huge science geek, sciencedaily.com. I, I check it through most categories every day. I, I really think, uh, I, like when we're driving, we listen to the news. That's good. Uh, news radio. But the rest of the time, it's, it's really good to get your news from the written word mm-hmm. and, to, and to see who we're going to support by our clicks. Mm-hmm. If we're if we're providing our clicks to uh, to people whose political goals we don't support, then then we're actually voting with our fingers. And so keep focus on good stuff like this show, like you and your your husband and the great stuff that you're doing. Well, thank you. I so appreciate that, and that is so true because now every click it does represent dollars for this financially driven um, news. Yes. And, it's got to be in quotation marks now because it's very activist driven. Um, all of the big, the big networks. Um, but the the other thing that I was going to say about the that contagion effect. Um, this guy, the one that lived, right, the El Paso guy that lived. If he has any access at all to hearing news, then he knows that what he did has impacted a presidential election. Yes. All of these Democratic hopefuls are now fundraising off of his acts. Yes. I mean, if that isn't like, I mean, powerful to a, a person who felt powerless and voiceless and, you know, disconnected from life, I mean, he is on the world stage now, whether his name gets mentioned or not. And I, I don't know that we can fully understand how dangerous that is for empowering the next person out there that is, is feeling like, wait a minute, uh, what about me? I, I want to have an impact. And if this is how you get an impact, sign me up. I can do that. That's, it's terribly dangerous. And I think we're very yeah. careless. I, I talk to and I train people who are bodyguards at all levels, both politicians and civilians. And you know, they're they're a bodyguard for a politician that's a dirtbag. They know it, they despise the person. So why do you do it? Why do you put your life on the line for somebody like this? Mm-hmm. And they will tell you that I'm not protecting that person's life. Mm-hmm. I'm protecting our way of life. Mm-hmm. One assassin with a bullet can undo the votes of millions of people. Mm. And what they've actually done is they have destroyed our way of life. They've destroyed our political system. Mm-hmm. Think about that. That's the protector, the sheepdog. If one assassin with a bullet can, can, can undo the votes of millions of people, or if you kill this celebrity that's beloved by millions of people, to kill that one person is doing harm to millions of people, to kill that one person is undoing the votes of millions. But what you're saying, and this is important, the same harm that's being done by an assassin is also being done as the media takes these killers and turns it into political fodder. And so not only have they done the harm of taking these lives, they've also done harm to our way of life and our political system through the media and, as you will, these, these political contenders using this as, uh, as fodder for their, uh, for their agenda. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we've, uh, I've taken so much of your time. We need to start winding down. You've been very, very generous uh, with your time and your information. Um, I know that you have an event coming uh, here in Phoenix. Uh, it is called the Safe, what is it called? The Safe Schools and Healthy Students Seminar. Uh, it's going to be held on Saturday, September 14th at the Sheraton Crescent Hotel Ballroom in Phoenix, Arizona. There are tickets for sale now. It's an all-day event. Uh, I'll put the link on your guest page at gunfreedomradio.com. 
Um, but uh, what? who needs to hear what you're going to present uh, on that day? Is it, stu is it students themselves? Is it parents? Is it teachers? Is it administrators? Who needs to hear this message? You know, that, that presentation is focused on parents, on business owners, on school personnel, on teachers, administrators. Uh, mature teens are always welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. Spouses are always welcome. Uh, obviously, law enforcement. But, you know, we, we're one of our nation's leading trainers of, of house of worship safety, sheepdogseminars.com. Mm -hmm. Before nine people murdered in a church in Charleston, before 26 people murdered in a church in Texas, we've been teaching house of worship security seminars, sheepdogseminars.com. And, and what keeps your house of worship safe, keeps your business safe, keeps your school safe, keeps your daycare safe. The next thing we're, we're going to see, I pray that I'm wrong, but we, Belgium saw a daycare massacre. China's seen repeated daycare massacres. We've got to focus on keeping our daycare safe as well. So anybody, uh, all armed citizens who are looking for empowerment and, and knowledge, uh, law enforcement obviously know my presentation and your spouses. This is really, it, although we use school safety as a, as a forum, it, it is the basic uh, house of worship safety, church safety, uh, uh, school safety uh, dynamic that applies across the board. The, the things that we talk about to keep school safe, we've done in our own home. Laminate film on the glass, on the door, beside the door, so you can't shoot out a glass and reach and open the door. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't do any good to lock the door if somebody can shoot out the glass and reach in and open the door. And so one of the little things we talk about is laminate film. Uh, uh, it just that it's in, in your home, in your house of worship, and other places where we can get the word out and protect people. Mostly anybody who cares about our children and cares about our way of life. Private schools, I fear that our private religious schools are, are, are targets so far. We've avoided any multiple homicide in a private religious school for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but the internal threat to them is smaller. The external threat is as great as ever. Mm -hmm. For somebody to come to that, uh, that, that daycare or to that, to that church school, uh, they've got to protect themselves and they've got to learn what they need to do. And denial has no value. Uh, that's what is going to happen during this presentation. Any American citizen who wants to be empowered, who wants to be part of the answer, who wants to protect their loved ones, uh, this is what we recommend the, the presentation to. Very good. And it's also, it's sponsored by the AZ CDL Foundation and Faster Saves Lives, which is a group out of Ohio that's been teaching and training faculty, administration, and staff, um, not not only the armed response and situational awareness, but also the medical, the trauma uh, medical, like you were talking about earlier with the uh, the tourniquets, yeah. how, how we can take measures immediately in the immediacy of an emergency situation to um, save lives of people that have been uh, injured. And it doesn't even have to necessarily be, um, you know, a, an armed attacker. It can be somebody in shop class, right? Yeah. If we don't know how to, how to help. On that, Cheryl, you talked about that. Uh, Faster had been trading in Ohio and Colorado, Arizona, and and eighty five percent of all counties in Ohio now have some armed indicators. But uh, did you know that? I didn't know that. Didn't know that. Uh, ever since Columbine, schools across Utah that how many? Nobody knows. It's completely decentralized. The individual principal, the individual superintendent makes a call. But ever since Columbine, they've been armed educators in virtually every school in Utah with 100% success. 85% of all kiddos in Ohio have some armed educators. Why isn't that in the news? Yeah. When we talk about arming educators. We act like it's some weird, goofy idea when the truth is it's being done nationwide with great success. Dr. John Lott released a study three months ago. There has never been a homicide in a school during the school day with armed educators. It costs nothing. The entire state of, of Ohio, 85% of all counties have armed educators in their schools and it cost them nothing. Uh, the teacher's gun, the teacher's ammo, and the training was donated or the training was funded by outside people to make it possible. So there are things we can do and then faster is part of the answer there. We'll be talking more about them during that conference. That the idea that we can arm educators, everybody thinks it's like some revolutionary goofy idea because it has been censored. And, and the fact that it's being done nationwide with great success is vital info that we all need to have to properly uh, apply our resources. 
Absolutely. And you know how you know it's had 100% success? Because you haven't heard it in the news. And I guarantee you, if there was any kind of a, a blip on the radar, they would be all over that. Do I yes. lie? <laughs> I'm going to steal that from you. I'm going to start using that. It's, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Um, so, and, and the other thing is that, you know, people get, they get locked up when they think, what do you mean arming teachers like they're one dimensional creatures that can only live inside of a classroom? Well, for me personally, I, I'm not an educator, but what I say is whatever my day job is, I am going to be armed because that I'm trained, I'm responsible. So I'm going to be armed. So why would you, if my day job was a, being an educator, why would you disarm me? Yeah, and even more so with children. It's burned into our neurons to die for our children. Mm -hmm. Sandy Hook School Massacre, the first one to die was the principal, charged in the killer. The second one to die was the school psychologist, charged in the killer. Third one to die was a teacher blocking the door at their body. Mm -hmm. a, 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 a elementary school principal told me one time, she said, I will die for my children tomorrow. Give me something besides my keys, my hand, when that day comes. Yeah. Those words, they haunt me. It, it, you got to recognize those teachers will die for their kids. I mean, what, 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 did those, what did they accomplish at Sandy Hook? Nothing. They were another body count. They weren't even a speed bump. Mm -hmm. But they laid their life down on just a remote chance of tack tackling this killer and taking the gun away. Uh, I, I, those they will die for those children. Let's give them some of the sides our keys to hand when that day comes. Absolutely. And certainly the state of Arizona should be ahead of Ohio in arming educators right now. And yet every everybody thinks it's some weird wacko idea when it's been done with great success over 20 years. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with that more. And uh, in the, the Parkland High School shootings, there was that coach who placed his body between the armed assailant and students. And I don't know that he would have been one that would have, um, because with FASTER, you, you not only have to volunteer, but you have to be nominated by your fellow uh, staff members. So you can't just get, you know, Mr. Smith, who's just a little too eager to be armed, right? Or, you know, so there is this whole process. But, and I don't know if he would have been that person who would have self-selected into being an armed teacher. But I have to believe that if you're gonna stand between an armed assailant and your students, that he, he already demonstrated that I am willing and able to protect and die uh, mm -hmm. these stu for these students. Give him something, yes. right? So that he isn't, and, and the other thing is that whatever number he was in that, that horrible murder, uh, spree that this person went on if he had been an armed staff member it probably would have stopped right then we have no way of knowing but we can we can anticipate and guess it would have stopped right then so number if he was number five then then the sixth person killed and the seventh person killed and the eighth person killed they would be alive today even more so Cheryl even more so the killer probably wouldn't even have tried it if he knew were there people that, that could yes. shoot. Exactly. The greatest achievement is a crime that didn't happen. We can never measure in all these armed educators and all these schools, the greatest achievement is a crime that didn't happen because the kid knows there's people gonna shoot back. Exactly, and those things are unknowable so we can't measure them. And so the other side gets to have more and more sound bites about you know the gun violence number that also includes the times that you know armed citizens have used their firearms to save lives and defend lives they lump all of that together and so we can't know how many school shootings or mall shootings or synagogue shootings or church shootings or whatever have well, been stopped because yeah. an armed populace an armed society is a much more polite and safe society uh, one, one angle on that when did the word shooting become a term for mass murder? Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. We, we, we've got to stop blaming it on the object. Massacre is a good word. Massacre is a good old word. But see how we've been trapped by the language that's been fed to us. Yes. When we use the word shooter to refer to a mass murder. You know, I, I tell everybody, and, and from the current administration pushing down, stop using the phrase active shooter response. Yes. Right? And whenever somebody uses the phrase active shooter response, mock them 
until we'd be real busy during deer season. You know, we'd be out to the range every day. You know, we, we're in a state full of active shooters, you know, and we're yeah. going to take action before he fires a shot. And there's yeah. other ways besides the guns he might choose to kill us. And so active assailant. And whenever you hear that phrase, you know, uh, shooting being used as a mass murder, uh, kind of stop yourself. It took me a year to retrain myself. It took me a year to retrain myself and get that completely out of my language. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about this mass murder, this massacre as a shooting, we've fallen into their hands. Mm -hmm. You know, words control the debate. Are they illegal immigrants or are they undocumented, are illegal aliens or undocumented immigrants? You know, so the words control the debate. And the right. one thing we can control is the words come out of our mouth. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so that's kind of a final point to recognize how we're constantly at war, how we were being fed, the very words were being fed. When we call these murders, these massacres, shootings, yeah. is anti-gun propaganda come out of our mouth and we don't even recognize it. And all your listeners out there, we can make a difference starting with the very words that come out of your mouth. Amen. And thank you so much for, um, for saying that and, and reminding me, uh, because I, I try to focus on the action. It was murder. Yes. That's already illegal. It's already yes. immoral. It's already horrible. It's not, uh, it, so yes, you're correct. And the other word that we've tried really hard, especially being firearm store owners, is to excise the phrase assault rifle and assault weapon. Assault is an, is an action, it's an aggressive action, and we sell tools of defense, we sell tools of sporting, we sell tools of hunting, and yeah. it is offensive to me to call these things that, that I sell to law-abiding American citizens an assault anything. Oh, wow. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, just to wrap up again, we're going to see you in Phoenix, Arizona very, very soon on Saturday, September 14th, 2019. And uh, the tickets for this event, it is an all-day event. There's going to be a special VIP reception to meet and greet with you between 8 and 9 a.m. And then general admission starts at 9 and goes until 5 Um Tickets will be available on the, when we go to gunfreedomradio.com, click the guest tab, choose Colonel Dave Grossman on that page. The, the tickets are available and we are so excited. I am absolutely going to mark out my entire day and be there. And uh, I look very much forward to all that you have uh, to teach us during that day. Yeah, looking forward to it. God bless and all the best to you and your your wonderful businesses and your your awesome listeners who are seeking deeper knowledge and bypassing the the uh, the, the barricade of knowledge that has been set up by our mass media. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you as well. And we've mentioned a lot of websites during this show, and I will put all of those on your guest page. Uh, but your your main one is Killology.com. All of the books that you've written and co-written and that you recommend to others are on that site. Also, you're on uh, Facebook, I believe, at Killology. Uh, or is it, what, what's your Facebook page? It's probably Dave Gross. <laughs> Joe, what's my Facebook page? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Perfect. All spelled right. Out. OT, spelled out. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, spelled out. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for all your time. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for your service to our country. Uh, and your continued service to our country with all that you're teaching us. Colonel you. Dave Gross. God bless you. Bye-bye. God bless you.